Okay, welcome back um, to our final presentation for this session. Um, our speakers uh, come to us from the Bureau of Meteorology, Ioana Ioannou and um, Mao Lu, uh, who are software engineers working on forecast systems development. And their presentation is on using Jupyter Notebooks to develop and share interactive data displays. Hi, all. Thank you. So we're going to do a tag team with this presentation. I'll take the first part. Give you a bit more background about what we do to give you some context as to what we're presenting today. Uh, so part of our project involves verifying the accuracy of the Bureau's forecasts, which involves taking uh, the values of the forecasts that forecasters produce and the observations of vari at various stations around Australia, bringing them together and uh, calculating a whole bunch of metrics uh, that represent the quality of the forecast. And we do that at many station points, many, many groups of stations around Australia. We have many different lead times. So like lead time is a concept in meteorology that like, um, you know, the Bureau basically issues a forecast for seven days every day. So a lead time of seven days is like, the, it's the forecast for like next Friday. So we might, this might come up in the presentation. So I'm just like, you know what that is from now. So we, we analyze all that data and we come up with metrics and plots and we need to share that with other people in the Bureau, like forecasters who come up with the forecast since they want to know how well they're doing, managers who are interested in uh, how the whole process is working, and other scientists. So where do notebooks fit in here? We're a multidisciplinary team. So in our team, we have us for software developers, but we also have people like Harry here at the front, who is a forecaster and he has recently been converted to Python. <laughs> so um, we find that notebooks are a really nice platform for scientists to be able to get in and do some data analysis. They don't need to install anything on their machine. They can just get in and, 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 and with basic knowledge of Python, get started. They have excellent facilities for plotting and visualization, as I'm sure everybody in this and in this many conf is using notebooks, so I'm sure you all know about it. Um, so we use notebooks, basically the scientists have a chance to get in and they pull the data in the notebooks and, and do data analysis and visualization, and they may then want to share that. Problem is notebooks are pretty, I mean, you can, you can export a notebook as an HTML or PDF, but that's a static representation. And the data we're dealing with is very multidimensional, so this is an example of one of the dashboards we created, and it's got, it's got like seven drop-down boxes, which add up to 327,000 plots. So to put that in one notebook or like one whatever is impossible, or it's not practical. So we need people to be able to explore the data. And this is where interactive data displays come in. So in, in developing our own dashboard, we had some requirements about at least the plotting technology. That's one of the, part of the solution is what plotting technology you use. You want something that will be interactive in the browser so you can just give people the link and they can go and, and load it up and play with the data. You want to allow dynamic data selection of what's actually in the plot so that you can more easily explore. And you want people like uh, Harry here to be able to easily learn it and use it to create plots. So people who don't know anything about websites should be able to use these technologies to come up with web-based displays. And lastly, an important aspect for us is to be, allow Python callbacks because often we'll want to pull more data out dynamically and uh, generate plots on the fly. So let's have a look at, I think these are the three most dominant plotting technologies in Python at the moment. And we'll have a look through an interactive example at each one of them. If I can just get to that. Here we go. So in this example, we're loading some forecast and observation data of minimum temperature for Melbourne for last winter. And we will make this available. This is available on the GitHub, so we'll share that link with you if you want to have a closer look at the code. So this is Maplotlib to start with. 
it's everybody uses Matplotlib, everybody knows it. It's not the nicest API, but everybody knows it, so there's plenty of help. You can figure out what you want to do almost all the time without too much effort. So this is our Matplotlib plot. It's not terribly interactive. You can pan and you can you can zoom. I won't do it now. But it's a bit hard turning this way. But you can use the box there to, to zoom in. And that's about where the interactivity ends. They do have some widgets that you can use to add some extra interactivity, like sliders built into Matplotlib, but they look really ugly and they're not easy to, to use. So let's move on to Bokeh. Now, as you may notice, Bokeh is the longest one. <laughs> and out of the three of those, it took us by far the longest to figure out how to do this simple plot. So Bokeh is more interactive. It's got more tools up here. You can do the box zoom and select. Um, there's a tap thing, which we still haven't quite figured out what it does. But it, <laughs> it hides some data when you tap it. As you can see, it's got mouse overs, but they're not particularly well done. When you've got lots of data, they overlap each other. And they're not actually giving you anything about the data by default. We had several efforts trying to figure out how to get it to show as meaningful mouse overs. And it was just taking too long. So we <laughs> got frustrated. <laughs> so. Bokeh is promising, but the API is just not as very intuitive. And because it's newer, there's not that much help online. You have to convert your data into their data format. So we had to like get our data into another data frame to pass it to the Bokeh scatter function. And then we had to create a column data source just to make it the line along the, <laughs> you know, the y equals x line. So yeah. Bokeh wasn't the solution that we were after. So let's come to Plotly. This is our Plotly code. It's not much longer, or it's similar size to the map Plotly version. You just um, tell it what to do with each lead day. In this case, we're plotting data by lead day, so each color corresponds to a particular lead day. Um, so you just make each scatter trace, you add it into it data list, you create your layout however you want it, and then you just tell it to sh show you the plot. We find that Plotly has a very intuitive API for creating plots. So this is what you get without really needing to define any, anything fancy. Now the nicest thing is that here you can actually click these and you can like select what data is actually in the plot at any one time, so you can explore like the difference between the forecast for the first, for lead day one, like tomorrow, and lead day seven. In this case, they don't seem to be particularly different, but normally you would expect that the lead day seven forecast would be more inaccurate than the lead day one forecast. Um, yeah, so the other stuff that Plotly can do is um, without any, any coding, you get meaningful mouse overs. And of course you can do all the other stuff, like selecting data, um, zooming in, and all that sort of stuff. So it's very interactive in the browser, and it's easy to use, and the documentation is decent. At least, even though it's not as widely used as Matplotlib, because their API is intuitive, you can get to learn it quite easily. So let's go back to our slides. How do these three compare? Based on our criteria, we found Matplotlib to be not so good at browser interactivity and dynamic data selection. It's fairly easy to use. We found Bokeh to be pretty good at interactivity, but not easy to use. And we like Plotly, obviously. Um, now, I haven't talked about Python callbacks. For that part, we decided to use this other library called IPy widgets. It's basically a suite of UI widgets for IPython notebooks, so you can add drop downs, uh, sliders, whatever you want to a notebook. And, it, and you can define callbacks in Python to be able to, say, interactively select what you want to plot, as an example. So the benefit of IPy widgets is that it's basically a wrapper for all the JavaScript you would otherwise have to write to do this stuff in a website. Um, 
the downside is that if you want it to be a static HTML page that you share, IPy will just won't work. You need a Python kernel for them to work correctly. Uh, so let me go back to give you a quick look-see at what IPy would just reflect, looks like. Um, continue with our example. So this is uh, a bit of code to add a widget to the notebook. In this case, I've defined a dictionary that's got all the, dif the different plotting methods and pointers to, the, to each method. And I've created a select widget for these methods and a plot scatter function that will get called whenever you select one of these methods. And we link them with the interactive um, object. So now that I've got these, I can select bokeh here. Oops. And I get a bokeh plot and a plot plot. So pretty easy, right? Now, we're still in the notebook here. If we want to be able to share our data more broadly, a notebook is not ideal. So I'll hand over to Mao, who will take you through how to share notebooks in a more generic way. <laughs> Hi. Can you hear me? Cool. OK. Um, I will try to not hit my head on anything. Okay, can we please have a show of hands? Who here have had to make a website for their results? Okay, the rest of you who don't have your hand up, uh, you will. Um, <laughs> who here loves JavaScript? Whoa. <laughs> okay, okay, so um, when we want to share our notebook with someone, uh, this can either be as simple as giving the notebook URL to someone who works in the same office, or we can email the notebook. And the problem is when you give someone a notebook URL or the notebook file, it's not exactly visually friendly. So from just the display perspective, almost always you will only see the code at the start. Right? When in reality, the person you're sharing the results with really just wants to see the graph. And if you're sharing a URL, uh, I think some Geosciences Australia speakers have talked about security concerns. Um, if you give someone a URL to your Jupyter Notebook instance, they can run code on your computer or on your server, and that has huge implications. Now, who do we share our results to? Um, so, so Joanna is a great drawer as well, <laughs> as a programmer. Uh, we have forecasters and managers and scientists and people who, a lot of people who generally aren't really interested in our code. And sometimes we just want to hide all the dirty laundry away, um, as Tennessee was saying before. Um, the people that really want to see the results aren't necessarily programmers. And we want to expose the data, uh, the results to them. And this is not a new problem. Outside of the data science world, you know, in the world where you're talking about business KPIs and metrics, um, dashboards in software as a service has existed for a long time. Uh, some of you may have had the displeasure of working with Tableau. Um, you know, if you want to use one of these, you will have to pay money, generally, and you will have to use their UI and their data formats. And scientists tend to be quite unique in what data they have. And so, uh, of course, Jupyter dashboards uh, is our savior. And what it does is it allows you to serve your notebook as a web app directly. And so let me show you this. This is a dashboard that, well, this is the interactive display that Joanna has built. If you send this to someone, this is what they see. As you can see, there's no code. If I can click, interactivity is preserved. He uses the same underlying data. You get the same results. It's just that the results are right there front and center. Right. And the technology, um, the reason why this is really cool is that it allows the, it allows the published result and your development to work on the same data format. So your scientists and your developers can work on your results inside a notebook using the Jupyter Notebook instance. 
And as soon as you're done, you save that notebook, and it becomes a web application that everyone else sees. And all of that has all the access to the data you have underneath. And so you don't have to learn jQuery. You don't have to learn Ajax. You don't have to you know, try to convert your Python data format into something that's web friendly. All you do is set up a notebook server and a dashboard server, point them to the same notebook files, and you're good to go. Um, now, there are, of course, drawbacks. Uh, let's say you write a dashboard that loads a gigabyte of data uh, every time you go visit the dashboard, and you have 100 visitors. I hope you have a big enough machine. Um, so this is not really for large-scale publication. Right? If your website has 1,000 visitors every hour, this is obviously not the right solution. But generally, in, especially in the data science world, we tend to work in smaller teams. And you may get, you know, if you're lucky, you may get 20 king visitors per day. And that would be great. I would love to have 20 king visitors per day. And, <laughs> and that's enough. It doesn't, it's not a huge draw on your resources. And your, you get to let your results do the talking. You don't have to be present for a meeting every time someone wants to look at your results. Um, and it is really, really fast from prototyping to publication. So uh, Harry here, we gave him the power to make plots. And next minute, we have 327,000 plots. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so uh, let's, let's make one. And so oh, here we are. OK, so uh, before, we were loading some data relating to Melbourne. Uh, now let's, in the same data file, we actually have all the capital cities. Right, so let's build a dashboard with a couple of drop-down boxes. And we'll, we'll show you the display. Uh, importing some things up there. And we use Plotly because we like to keep our sanity. Um, here we load the data and define the station numbers for every capital city. Uh, this is a Plotly plotting function. As you see, it looks quite similar to before. And let's say we pick Hobart and Winter. That's what we see. But if we say pick <coughs> Canberra, we see it's actually a bit colder. So if you have friends in Hobart, tell them to stop complaining. Um, <laughs> This is a widget for selecting a city. No JavaScript so far. Selecting a season. And we simply hook them up together in one interactive object. And in this particular case, it's interacting the different widgets to the Python callback function, update, iplot, scatter. And that goes into the widget, pulls out a value, Course plot function. And so as you click on different things, they update. Right. Now, we can, uh, hold up. Now, we can actually modify the look and feel of things. So this is just a notebook extension. And if we have more cells, I can show you more. But we can actually change the width of things and put more things here. We can drag it around. Right? And so for this whole process, you haven't done any CSS, no JavaScript. Your callbacks are in Python. You have made a web app without leaving Python land. And whew, lost it. There we go. <laughs> OK, and so this is an app we just made. And if we spend a bit more effort at you know, playing with a layout, this is what we get. 30 minutes work. All right. um, you know, uh, many of you would have played with you know, using markdown descriptions in notebooks. This is a markdown cell. We have some text explaining what the plots do. OK, uh, we have interactivity for everything. The update, you can actually hook this in to update multiple plots. Hobart summer. 
down some. As you can see, uh, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so this is a very simple way of turning your Jupyter notebooks from a scientist experiment inside your own little laptop to something that you can share with your managers, with external collaborators. Um, you, can, you can let your data do the talking. Right? And the GitHub will have a sample of the data we use and all the notebooks. So it also has some installation instructions. Hopefully they work. Um, and the slides. And the slides, that's right. So um, feel free to go replicate that. And thank you. Well, we've got a little bit of time for questions. Hi, great presentation. Um, well, my question is, um, given that uh, Jupyter is uh, Julia, Python, and R, you didn't compare ggplot2 as one of the graphics uh, solutions, which I think is, has some very, very powerful uh, ad uh, advantages and features. We were trying to stay in Python land, um, as this is a Python conference. But, uh, but you're using Jupyter. <laughs> that's true, but uh, Python inside Jupyter. <laughs> but do, do you have any um, assessment of too? I haven't used it on the web, so I can't. I, I've used it like for papers, and it's great. But I haven't used it interactively on the web. I'm not sure how, how it does in that respect. Uh, great talk. I um, wonder if either of you have any thoughts on Jupyter Lab and how that might affect your work and whether you're excited or the opposite. Uh, Jupyter Lab is very exciting and the last dozen or so commits to Jupyter Dashboard Server has been making it compatible with Jupyter Lab. So yes, it's definitely on the horizon, but it's not quite ready yet. Uh, for the talk, you're running your notebooks off of your own laptop. Where would they normally be running in your work environment? Do you do it on your own laptop and then share that to other people, or have you got a centralised server, and how do, what's that using? Uh, we have a fairly beefy Linux box that we share around, and we've got Jupyter Hub running on there, so everyone log into the same system. Um, but you can run it on your own laptop. That should be an issue. But we also have a VM for just running the dashboard so that our server resources don't get to use that if people come to the to the dashboard itself. Yeah. Um, just just a question on, on I guess uh, one of the things that, that the group I work in is kind of uh, struggling with I guess is is which one of these sort of solutions we end up going with for reporting. I guess have you where are you with this? It sounds like a relatively kind of like you're relatively far along with this, but. Is is this the way you're presenting your results to the clients, for lack of a better word, or yeah, is it still are there still ten things up in the air for you? Or? Our current dashboard actually uses Matplotlib, but we plan to move all our plots to Plotly. Um, we quite like the dashboard with Plotly solution. We think yes, it's a pretty nice way to go. But we're open to <laughs> this. This area is really fast evolving, so every day is like there's something new. So you have to. We're open to new new things that come up. Yeah, hi. Uh, what happens if you get really lucky and you suddenly have a thousand people that want to look at it? Well, where can you go? Do you have lots of money for Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, in that case, when you all of a sudden start getting lots of visitors, uh, you may want to actually commit to doing some of your code in JavaScript, and you'll actually you know want to build a proper web app at that point if you. If your site is open to the World Wide Web and you have lots and lots of users, but um, getting that many users should bring a lot of funding as well. Sure. Well, we can also note that Plotly um, is quite capable of. Uh, it has a JavaScript side as well, so um, you don't really necessarily have to change your technology. Um, like you can pretty easily convert your plotly, your Python plotly to to JavaScript. <laughs> so um, that's consideration. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so how do you balance the need between interactive interactivity and interactive plots versus publication quality figures? Yeah, well, obviously, <laughs> the, the, the requirements are different for interactivity and publication. So um, at the moment, as I said, most of our plots are in Maplotly because that is what's used for publication. But we will explore how, how Plotly does in that respect. It is possible to like just export your Plotly plots uh, as you can do in Maplotly. So presumably, it's just a matter of um, you know styling them such that they um, are of publication quality. Yeah. Yeah, is your dashboard server talking to remote kernels through the kernel gate gateway? Uh, yes, it is. But for security reasons, the kernel gateway is only hosting to uh, is only listening to local host. And then, you know, so in that case, you can't actually attack the gateway directly. Uh, no, I was just wondering if in, uh, in Dashboard there's some um, sort of a halfway house um, back to the Python notebook in the sense of um, having uh, widgets that are actually um, Python code widgets. Uh, which widgets? Like, you know, a widget in which you can enter Python code. There is a text widget, uh, like the widgets where you can enter text, yeah. but I think um, it's quite easy to make sure that the input is sanitized. I don't, I don't think there's any code execution possibilities through the widgets themselves. Yeah, there's, so there's no like sandbox deval or something? I don't... Uh, no. Yeah. Um, so the dashboard is made in such a way where you can't execute arbitrary code, only code that already exists inside the notebook. And so if you made a widget that can accept arbitrary code into into the widget and then execute them, you may as well use a notebook instead. Uh, depends on what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, you know, if you start allowing people to execute arbitrary code from a dashboard interface, um, it kind of gets rid of a lot of the security gains from using a dashboard interface. <laughs> And so, you know, at that point, you need to be very, very careful about who you give the dashboard URL to. There is also the option of making the dashboards require authentication. We haven't done it in our case because of the way we set it up, but that is possible. Okay, and I think we've got time for one more question. Um, just on authentication, um, is it possible to restrict access to certain subsets of the data via the dashboard? I think you would have to make the users authenticate in that case and then do some kind of <laughs> oh, yeah, user-based access. Yeah, wondering if there's any more fine-grained access control just beyond have access or don't have access. Um, not, not in the current version. It's still quite early. But um, you can possibly program that logic. We should note that this like dashboarding stuff wasn't available like six months ago. So it's something that's very new. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much for a really engaging presentation. Thank you.